heart is pounding because I'm wondering what is in this box now? What type of question? Remember, if you want to submit your question, you can email it or you can see Sister Claudette. And you can just send a question and I will try my best to answer it. So this question says, Brother Patrick, you are always encouraging people to pray specific prayers. So if we ask God to reveal specific things to us, for example, who, <laughs> who our enemies are. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing. <laughs> Who our enemies are. <laughs> you think we want to find out? <laughs> we'll be shocked. <laughs> Mercy. Who our enemies are and the person responsible for giving us an accursed thing or what exactly that accursed thing may be. Can we trust that once we surrender and give everything to the Lord, that he, the time, God will reveal it? So in other words then, the, the, the questioner is saying then that if you, okay, okay, I heard, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, all right. The first is asking this question. Um, how can I tell who my enemy is? And will God then reveal the accursed things that that person, and the person who also give it to you, don't, isn't it? Yeah. And if I surrender everything then, will God reveal everything unto me? Is that, what's the question? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, you see, vengeance is the Lord. Mm. And... If the Lord was to tell some of us who our enemies are, we probably wouldn't be in this church today. Because when you hear that is your best friend, or your sister, sorry, or your brother, we're talking blood here, or your mother, what are you going to do then? You know how many cases we have been on where the witchcraft is sent by the mother? Several several cases. So if God was to show you in wisdom, are you going to say, no, no, I'm not going to do anything. I I'm going to play cool. <laughs> <laughs> you ever heard when you, you hit, you know, your enemy or some stranger that don't hurt you. It's your friend that hurt you. It's somebody close to you. That's when it really hurts. So God is a God of wisdom, you see. Because if God was to show us some of our enemies within our churches, people you go to their home and eat, mercy. You would get a machete ready. You know what I mean? <laughs> You'd be like, hold me back, hold me back. Come on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No matter, you see, when emotion kicks in and anger, no matter how you said, I'm going to play cool, it's a different story when you recognize who your enemy is. That's why God don't need to show us, you see. What we need to do is say, Lord, protect me from my enemy. That's why so when he put on the umbrella over you and the covering, you don't have to worry about your enemy. We just give it to Jesus. So again, if you are praying and praying, the Lord will reveal the accursed things. Again, it's not necessary to even show you who it comes from. Unless you are at that place with God, where God can reveal things to you. You know, because no matter what you say, you know, some people react. I mean, if you know that somebody is your enemy and you come to church, that person come up to give you a hug, that's going to be the coldest hug. Probably your hands wouldn't even go up. You'd be like, okay. <laughs> No, this is real. <laughs> no, it's, it's automatic. The lips can say anything, but what the body does is completely different. I'm telling you, we are, we are moved by emotions. And once somebody hurt you, your body just, all the limbs are gone. It's not you any longer. I'm telling you, 
you don't even want to approach. The person's coming up and you turn aside and don't want to look at them. What clicks in there? I'm telling you, so it's hard. So what we have to do is let's be people of God. Pray for encouragement. Pray for positive things. Don't worry about who hurt you. I mean, sometimes God will show us if we are able and strong enough to take it. You know what I mean? If you don't get mad, God can show you who your enemy is. And as you pray, you said, the Lord says to you, don't do that. I don't eat. I don't go to their house. And when you go there, don't eat. I remember I was praying for a lady. And she was telling me that her mother was in witchcraft. And she's an Adventist. And she went to a dinner with the family. And they took her dinner in the kitchen and really fixed it up. And by the time they brought hers and her husband, the Lord spoke to her and said, don't eat it. And then the Lord spoke to her husband. And both of them look at each other. And all eyes were on them, you see. And it's the family. They were being set up. And it's a, a wrestling match with witchcraft from her mother. I'm telling you. So, so what I'm saying then, in a nutshell, all we have to do is pray for protection. And God will reveal it if we don't come because we want to know, because we want to take revenge. And most times, that's why we want to know. You want to know who really did that to me. And God is not like that. God is a God of love. Most times, the people who send the witchcraft needs help. They are broken, and the enemy, they are an open door. And God wants to reach them and help them. So we have to pray for each other. You know what I mean? You know, we pray. You, you, you'd be sure to see how prayer works and how these people can turn around. I remember a pastor told me, and this is no fairy tale. A pastor told me about three years ago that he was preaching and when he looked in his congregation, there was a gentleman. And when he was finished, a special gentleman looking at him. When he was finished, he came up to him and says, this church is really powerful. I came to look myself. Because you see, I'm an Obia man. And a woman, no, it was a man came to me to kill his wife. And I tried everything possible and I could not kill her and I wanted to come to see what this church is really about the pastor told me personally I'm telling you we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood it's heavy duty stuff we ought not to you know pretend and you know it's real it's real brethren I'm gonna pray and then I'm gonna share a couple of testimonies so in terms of accursed things, the Lord will show us. But it's not necessary to even show us who it's coming from. Unless that person is a threat again and they're going to bring more. In wisdom, the Lord will show us. But we have to just humble ourselves before God and know that vengeance, it's the Lord. It's not ours, it's the Lord. Okay. Let us pray. Father in heaven, great God, we come to you again tonight with all the brethren calling in from different countries on the prayer line. We are here in this sanctuary of God. We're asking you now, Lord, to reconsecrate this sanctuary. Send your righteous angel to go around and to touch every heart and to touch every heart that is on the prayer line. Let tonight be a night of revival. Let tonight be a, a night that is not ordinary because we are coming to the throne room of God. I thank you now, Lord, for forgiving us of every sin and for preparing us and cleansing us. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray. Praise God. Praise God. Again, we just want to say welcome, Isaiah. Yes, he's looking up on me. And I see... Sister Michelle's sister over there. Tyra, how you doing? Blessing, blessing, blessings. God is really powerful. So the first testimony I want to share is that um, you heard on the prayer line 
Sister Augustine talks about that woman. I think she, she's probably, what, around 41? 40. So she's young, okay? And she has five children. And we heard about the story of she having a headache and going to the hospital and whatever happened, but it got worse and she went in a coma. And after we praying the prayer line, praying, 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 we continue in prayer and we heard that she is brain dead. And I spoke, we spoke and the story is that it's so crucial that they, they want to pull her from life support. And I'm here, I know I'm online and I know we're taping, but God's people have to be careful when you sign and sign over to make donation of your organs. And I'm saying it because if you go to the hospital and you sign up to give your organs and you are almost dead, they're going to make sure you're dead. Sorry, I can't say that. But, but they won't, I mean, they won't keep you on life support then for a long time because the organs have a time when they may where they are going to have no use. So we have to just be careful and be mindful. I mean, somebody called me up and they asked me, is it okay to give organs then? You know, somebody called me with that question already. And I said, listen, I can tell you that when you die, that body don't know nothing. You go into the grave. You know, but I'm not going to stand here and say I'm against giving organs to for somebody else to live, be, or given blood. You know what I mean? You know, because God gave the technology for human so that many lives can be saved. You know what I'm saying? So that's what's happening. So it's up to you. It's something you have to pray about, but you ought to just be careful of signing these documents because if you are in a predicament, they're going to be pushing to unplug you if you do these things. So somebody else called me again and talked about donating blood. You know, a lot of Christians are wrestling and want to know the right things. They want to do the right things about giving blood. And I know certain religions don't take blood. But you see, the Bible speaks about eating or drinking blood, that is not good. You shouldn't. But for medical purposes, it's different. And that's what I got from studying the scriptures. So we ought to be mindful. But what happened now is that we went into prayer and we were praying and wrestling for this woman with five children. I'm telling you, man, I was praying and begging God to save her. I'm saying, Lord, you have to save her. I went to the hospital. I went with Sister Augustine, and we went to look for the family there. And it's young families. It was very sad. But I want to praise God because before I got there, we were in prayer, and the Lord shows that She's not going to make it. So I went there to say, what am I going to say to them? Am I going to tell them that the Lord shows me that you're not going to make it? So I went there and we gathered everybody in the room, even before Sister Augustine got there, and I opened the word of hope to the family and how good God is. And, and what I told them is that we have to look at the legacy if something goes wrong. If we go in that room and pray and God decide, I don't want to heal her now. What are you going to do? What lessons is there for you to learn from that? Is everything organized? Is your life organized? You know what I mean? 
Is it sudden? When you look and see she just walk in the hospital, what do you think? What are you going to walk away with? And I was able to prep them and prep them. Instead of coming out and saying, listen, this is what, I prep them. And we, I have witness here. And within what, one day? Yeah. I think it's on Sunday. Sunday morning, I got the text that she passed away. And I'm in communication with the family. Amazing family. Loving family. And we're going to be heavy duty supporting. We're going to be at the funeral, which is going to be next week. But it was a sad story. I went over and encouraged her dad. He was standing in a corner. He wasn't even talking. And I went over. I'm going to tell you why I'm telling you this testimony, one more testimony. I'm going to tell you why. That God's people, when I walk in there, I was really piercing up and down. I said, God, I know sometimes we walk in and we see the healing. But Lord, couldn't you change your mind? You know what I mean? And then I remember Hezekiah, when he prayed for 15 years extension, the Lord extended his ears. And it become a curse if you study the story. So I said, let thy will be done then, Lord. But I know the Lord has given the family peace. Secondly, Sunday I was actually in the hospital again. And I'm sharing this. I know it's the, I'm sharing testimonies. We'll cut the word short. But hear what? Sunday, I went to a seminar. And I shared this already, but I'm sharing it for, again as the Lord impressed. There's something where I'm sharing this story. I went to a seminar for the, it's a pilot association, something to do with pilots. So we have pilots from different, here Canada, different places there. And when I was there, I saw a young man. He's not more than, he's shorter than the cameraman. <laughs> Sorry. You know, I'm not saying he's short, but I'm saying a little bit, you know. And he looks like younger than Shay. And he's in a, a pilot outfit. And I'm saying, could he really be a pilot? And then after the different speeches and he came up, he shared that he just loved planes. And he has been playing with planes from he's like 10. And at 15, he started to read all the books and whatever. But he went to Seneca and so I learned that he's a Seventh-day Adventist. And where he's staying now, because you see, he have to fly not necessarily smaller planes, planes that carry probably 70, 80 people until he builds up his hours. Because you need like 2,000 hours to go commercial or to fly the big jets like the a series. So anyway, where he's staying is where I have a powerful prior partner. And he knows her. And it's just all this testimony I started to share with him, he could identify. The point I'm saying, God sometimes put his people at places. And that young man says he's 25 years old and he have his commercial pilot license. Mm. And he just shared his testimonies of being, not worry about money, but giving everything to the Lord and trusting that God will work a way out. 25. And, and you know, <laughs> anyway, while we were there, I saw an older, elderly lady came in. And I look at her and said, I know her. So I went up to her, and she says, oh, yes, I'm, I'm such and such son, mother. And I'm like, what? And she says, he's in hospital right now, critical. And I took the number right away. As a matter of fact, I had his number in my phone. And as a matter of fact, he used to call me, and we prayed. And I haven't heard him like more than two to three weeks, and it's on my thought. And here the mom said, so I said, I'm going to the hospital. When that program finished, brethren, I went to the hospital. And when I went to the hospital again, 
I have a room with more people that is here, that is family, like just in turmoil. I went into the, the, the ICU first and they let me in. And when they let me in there, he was on the bed with, with all the machine, the most machine I ever see connected to a human. And I've been in ICU. Wow. And he's not, I saw the doctor, I asked the doctor, is he, can he hear me? And the doctor says no. The doctor says he's heavily sedated. And the doctor says, I said, what is the condition? What is the hope level? And the doctor says, like he's looking, the doctor is not looking well at all. It's like the doctor is saying, like, man, I don't know. So I just let him be. And now, after that was happening, I stood beside him and I was speechless because there's no movement. He's all like he's swollen and he's looking like he's dead, to tell you the truth. And I prayed for him. I prayed, and I'm confused, and I said, God, one more again? No, God, this is your servant. And while I was saying that to the Lord, his wife walked in, and she looked at me, and I tell her who I am, and she embraced me, and she looked all troubled in her face, and I encouraged her. And then when I get back outside, she took me to a room with many people, family members. I even recognize some people. And we opened the word. I was there sharing the word with them for at least three hours. Not kidding you. And they said that the operation, a major next operation, going to happen in, in the same evening. And then when we prayed and prayed, they came and said they're going to put the operation until the next morning. So I said, praise God. So again, I don't know if between, I was praying with my prayer partners between. And while we're praying, the Lord was giving us some scriptures that he's going to be alive. And I'm saying, thank you, Lord. It's not a death news again, you know what I mean? So I'm praying and praying. And then I prayed and I called his wife and said, listen, da -da. and then they put it off from the morning to the night, to the evening. And I said, praise God, this operation not going to happen in Jesus' name. We're claiming victory in Jesus' name. Mm. And that led up to, say, yesterday. Yesterday, they said it's going to happen in the evening. We prayed again. And then they said, tomorrow morning, which is this morning. And I'm, I, we call, and in deep prayer, the Lord says, like, we got the, 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 the answer, like, he's healed. So I called his wife and said, do you notice anything different? And she said, yes. They say his, his temperature, everything started to change. His pressure, everything on the machine started to change. And by the time Monday draws on sometime in the Monday until this morning, because they said they were going to do it now, 6 o'clock this morning. And I prayed again this morning after the prayer line. And... When I connect with them later, they say they did not do it neither because they seen sign of recovery. So they put a camera down inside of him. And they said things are, you know, his, his pressure coming up, everything. The machine was dead and it started to move. You know what I mean? All the machine that connects to him. And listen, brethren, they said that they're going to probably do the operation this evening again. And we went into prayer again. And we prayed and claimed it and said, Lord. So now, when I spoke to his wife, called me this evening and said, listen, um, he's doing really well. Everything is like he's coming back. But they said they have to go operate on his, on his leg. So we said, no. And I said, no, we're going to pray again. They can't. Call me back in 10 minutes. So we're going to pray again. And the Lord says, no. So when I call her back, she confirmed before I ever say anything that the Lord told her no. And I'm telling you, just before I got here now, she called me while I'm driving to this location. And I start to praise God. She says he opened his eyes. Listen, <laughs> give God a hallelujah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm telling you, if you've been in the hospital and seen this gentleman, Amen. you know that 
that a couple months ago, I wanted to interview him here. He's on one of my lineup. He's one of the most powerful singer in Toronto. And, and he promised to come. And I was wondering how we're going to get connected. I'm telling you, God is so powerful. And I'm rejoicing. Oh, God is not an ordinary God, man. <laughs> God is so big. God is so good. Yes. I'm telling you. Yeah, I know. Praise God. Because we were so down about Suzette. And then God answered this prayer in a different way. Mm -hmm. So what the Lord is saying then, when you die, if he purposed for you to die tomorrow, mm -hmm. you're going to have everlasting life in the second death. You won't face the second death. Mm -hmm. You know, he's putting her to sleep in peace. God is such a powerful God. An awesome God. You know what I'm saying? I'm just praising him. So that's the big news tonight. When I heard he opened his eyes. If I wasn't coming here, I would be heading to the, that hospital in, in Scarborough, General. I would be heading there. God is awesome. Okay, we're going to open our word tonight. And the Lord is able, he is powerful, he is good. The word I'm going to open is Ezekiel 34. And I'm going to go from verses 1 to 17. And I'm going to try going as fast as possible. We don't have a lot of time because of the testimonies. But I'm going to ask the Spirit of the Lord as he's going to be leading. You know, if I could title this sermon, I would call it Power Failure. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, and I hope the team is listening. <laughs> I would call it Power Failure. You see, it's about talking about shepherd and sheep. And I want you to really, really imagine concerning the sheep and the shepherd. Who is a shepherd, by the way? Think about it, because you see, we can think about the physical application, but I want you to think also of the spiritual application, because this is very, very deep tonight. God is going to, just by even reading it, it's going to sh show us so many things. So think about it. The shepherd. So you could describe it then and say, a shepherd is a person then. You're giving me a nice word that look after the pastor or the pastor or the sheep or the, you know. Okay. So then, the shepherd then is responsible for many things. You know what I mean? If you're a shepherd then and you have a hundred sheep before you, and we know all the characteristics about the sheep that they are so calm and, you know, one of the animals that is so humbled and, you know, you know what a sheep is, Bella. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so what I'm saying now, the shepherd have a lot of responsibilities because it's not like you're looking after some dogs. You know, who can defend themselves, you know what I mean? If anything goes wrong, these dogs are ready to take you down. Our wolves are. But these are sheep. And we know the story where the Lord says, he's the shepherd. And if one sheep is gone astray, he will go and find that one and bring back that one. That's the love. But when you look at this shepherd right here that he's speaking about, you can look at the shepherd and say it's the leaders supposed to be the shepherd, supposed to feed the flock. So the shepherd is responsible for many things. You could say feeding. They have to feed. Listen, the sheep will just stand there in a... In, just. Stand there and do nothing, and if there's no food, they're going to die. 
The shepherd who have his rod, who is in control, you see. He's responsible for what? Water. He's responsible for the, their security. To see if there's a wolf lurking around to eat one of the sheep. So, the, so therefore then, the shepherd have to be vigilant. Meaning have, he have to be looking at all times. I'm wondering how the shepherd sleep. He have to be looking at all times, just noticing and counting to make sure that everybody is in place and no sheep is gone astray. So he had a, 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 a general idea then of how many and he, he knows how they move. He knows everything about the sheep. That's what a shepherd's supposed to do. Observe their flock. Observe whatever God put you in charge of and you are the leader. If you are a pastor, you're a shepherd. If you are a priest, if you're an elder, you are not, you're a shepherd. You're supposed to set the guideline and make sure everybody is, you know, know who is weak and who is lame, who is broken, who needs some nurturing. But that's if the good shepherd paying attention. If the shepherd is not paying attention, there's going to be chaos because there's going to be sheep running all over the place and they're going to go the wrong direction and there's going to be no water down that way and wolves are going to be down there. If you go through the word and recognize some of the powerful shepherds who have sheep, hundreds, how they take care of them, and how they are serious, you know what I mean? In protecting them from the wolves. As we go through this scripture here, we're going to learn a lot of different things. You see, a shepherd cannot be selfish. And we have to compare it with today, with the churches with the leaders, if they are a little bit selfish and they are eating most of the feed, are they not paying attention to the shepherd, to the, 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 the sheep? And sheep are leaving. You know, it's getting smaller and smaller and nobody is noticing. Because you see, the shepherd is only looking on his agenda. And when you look on your agenda as a leader, how can you be a true and a good leader? When Christ died on the cross, he died for everyone. That's why when one sheep went astray, he went from the 99 and he went to look for the one. It meant that he was observing and he knew one is not with the, 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 the rest. Something is not right. God is calling us, he's calling his church to be serious shepherd that observe, not to be selfish, but to observe. I want to go to verse 1, and we're just going to go through them. And it says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, So the prophet is speaking, he is in, wrestling with God, and the word came to him. And that word came when you could say Israel or us going through something and we need direction. We need a leader to step forth who is willing to feed the sheep. So it was happening in a time when there was abuse and suffering going on when the word of the Lord came. And hear what it says in verse 2. It says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel, 
that do feed themselves, should not the shepherd feed the flock? Come on, this is some heavy word. Heavy. And this is going out to the people, the leaders, elders, pastors. Who are we feeding first? How is the flock going to be nourished? if we are not being fed. You see, there is all different types of sheep in the flock. There is some that is wounded, some that is even malnourished because they're getting veg vegan food but no protein or something, you know. There's a lot of nutrient trends that is lacking. But still, they are up there and they are praying and preaching but the flocks are not eating. It's going over their head probably because they are just looking on how intellectual they are and they are speaking on a different level, the PhD level. And little sheep that is in the congregation are hungry, not getting any food. They are just feeding themselves because when we feed ourselves as leaders, we pumped up and pride comes up and then everybody is starving and people are leaving the church. That's what the Lord is saying. He said, woe unto the leaders who are not doing the right thing, who are not feeding my sheep, who are not preaching the word, who are not preaching the three angels' message, who are not preaching the solid food, who are only preaching prosperity and tell how you can get rich and the best thing to do. And when you're done, you're all pumped up. But when you walk out, there's no hope for the brokenness you're going through. There's no hope to say, you know what? I went and I was blessed. I was depressed, but now I felt the peace of God upon me. We're not reaching where people really need the food. Therefore, the shepherd ought to know the flocks. You got to know who is broken as you look generally on everybody. There's brokenness everywhere. There's people who have been through abuse, have been through molestation, have been through rape. Is there seminars that will encourage somebody who was raped and in the congregation? What about a young mother who got pregnant in the church and she came back and nobody's even talking to them because the, you are looked down on. You messed up. While there's many other sheep that is doing worse, but they haven't been caught. But the Lord sees. The good shepherd sees everything. He looks over his sheep and he knows everything. And do you know you can be in the, with the whole 99, the 100, and the Lord will see that you are lost and you need to be encouraged. You don't have to walk away to be lost. You can be right in the congregation and hungry and needs to be fed. But the word of God is not piercing the hearts of people. The words of God don't have the urgency to tell people to wake up because Christ is about to come. We are preaching all feel-good messages. Preaching about prosperity and, 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 and feel-good when you walk out there, but there's no meat to it. There's no substance. When you go home, you're still broken, you're still weak. What should the shepherd do then? For the, the drug addict who comes and sits at the back, what should they do to the person who is on crack cocaine, who slipped in the church, 
But when the word being delivered, it's all high prophecies above their heads. There's no hope like the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemaker. To invite people to be peaceful. To invite people to fall in love with Christ. We are the messages that hit the hearts of God's people. Is the shepherds sleeping? They're only feeding themselves. That's what the Lord showed me. He said, the, she, the shepherds are feeding themselves. And if you are not a good shepherd, then in your workplace, in your home, you're not a good shepherd either. You're not feeding nobody but yourself. And if you're only feeding yourself, we're going to tell you what's going to happen later to you in this message. It's not ordinary tonight. It's not ordinary. The Lord is saying the church is broken and people are not, needs are not being met. And he said, woe be on. How many people knows about probation? How many people know about the Jacob's time of trouble? How many people know about the shaking? How many people know about these things? You ask certain Adventists and they have no idea. Because the meat is not being distributed. Everything is on the surface. The sermons are not waking up people out of their slumber to tell them that Jesus is at the door. And people are going to die. People are going to be burning in hellfire if we don't surrender. There's no nice way to say the Lord is a loving God and he cares. We know that. But he's also a serious judge. You don't want to mess with God. If you are not on his side in the last days, you're going to be in trouble. Many souls are going to be burned to a stopper. Burnt. The judgment hour is coming. And the Lord is saying his churches are not preaching the solid word. Everything is watered down. But praise God, there's also judgment for the shepherds. There's judgment for the shepherds for leading the sheep in the wrong pathway. For seeing the pastors over there with the green grass and for taking them around in the wilderness where there's nothing. Mercy. God is saying, woe be on to those people. I'm telling you, brethren, if church was to be the way it used to be, with the urgency messages that people need to repent and wake up now. I'm telling you, we will see urgency people coming in the church to know that the days are numbered. But when the sermons are finished, there is no urgency. People are coming in six of one and going out half a dozen. Same I'm telling you, it's serious, it's serious. <laughs> God is so powerful. Go to verse 3 and hear what it says. Verse 3 says, You eat the fat, and he clothed you with the wool. He killed them that are fed, but he feed not the flock. I'm telling you, this, this, this is so deep. This is deep. We're talking about taking the riches. All in it for yourself. All in it because you're just feeding the, the, the churches and telling them what they want because the offering plate is big. <laughs> and things is happening. Things are flourishing. No serious sermon to stir people. That if you don't even want to be in the church, don't play church. We need to preach sermons that people will walk out and say this, I'm not ready to serve God. You got to choose which side you're going to be on. God is not calling for people to play church. And that's what is happening. Because people are sleeping. The sermons finish 
You know, somebody I was talking to and they said they went to a church and somebody read one verse and preached like for an hour and a half about t- just the one verse. Nothing else. It's all different things. Just sermon with all words. We need to hear the word of God to know that the coming of Christ is soon. We need it. You see, look at yourself tonight, brethren. You're on the prayer line. Are you a shepherd tonight? Are you a sheep? What are the characteristics of a sheep? Well, more likely, the, the shepherd is supposed to be stronger than the sheep. Nowadays, you have the sheep is more stronger than the shepherd. So how can we have proper direction when the shepherd have no strength to offer, no food? How can they? People, the sheep are scared. They are looking for a leader to take them to higher grounds, and they can't find it. I'm telling you, this is is deep stuff the Lord is showing us tonight. Deep stuff. Deep stuff. I'm telling you, the shepherds, if you go and look what's going on around the globe, some of the shepherds are flying in private jet. It's all money laundry. All different things that is going on. And the Lord says, feed my sheep. What do you feed your sheep with? I mean, you look at it and see the shepherd feeding the sheep with grass and greens. But God is talking about a spiritual moment here. What do you feed your people in the church with? How do you teach them to prepare themselves for war? Prepare because Christ is about to come. How do you get the church charged up and be prepared? People praying and fasting and prayer and people dedicating their lives to Jesus. How do you do it? How do you do it? I'm telling you, the shepherd have a lot of work to do. And in verse 4 it says, The deceased have he not strengthened. Mercy. That's the weak in the congregation. Neither have ye healed that which was sick. Come on. You got to get the picture. The shepherd's supposed to look and see one of the sheep that is wounded. One leg he's walking and three and hopping around. With the wisdom of being a leader, you're supposed to look and see who needs some encouragement. Not who needs to be talked about and pushed down. God is speaking about spiritual upliftment here. That the shepherd's supposed to nurture the church and look for people who are in need and supply the needs. Feed them. That's what the Lord is saying. Feed them. And it says, neither have he healed that which was sick. Neither have he bound up that which was broken. Mercy. Neither have he brought again that which was driven away. Neither have he sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty you have ruled them. I'm telling you, I don't have to say much but read the word. I'm telling you, it's powerful. The Lord is saying that the whole congregation, the whole flock, of sheep is loaded with brokenness and a shepherd needs to identify and know what is going on. What wounds that needs to be healed and what methods to do. I'm telling you, back in the days, it's not any and anybody is a shepherd. You have to be strong and solid to fight off these wolves. I'm telling you, it's no ordinary being, being a shepherd. And God is likening it to us to say we are not ordinary. We have the spiritual strength and the spiritual power through Jesus. So if the shepherd is not doing his job, 
Where do the, the flock look then? People are going to be scattered all over. No wonder the churches are scattered. People believe in all different things. There's so many different doctrines coming up now about the, the Israelite doctrine and all different doctrines I'm hearing people believe in now. I'm telling you. Because the people are not being fed by the word. There's too much prosperity messages that have been preached. People don't even use the Bible anymore. The Lord is going to wake up people, brethren. I'm telling you. If you go to verse 5 and it says, And they were scattered because there is no shepherd, and they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. That's the main verse the Lord gave me. I want you to get it first. The Lord is saying then, if the shepherd is all about self and is all about nice messages and, and, and pride and money and not paying attention to the shepherd or the flock, what is going to happen is that without a good shepherd, naturally, if you look on a flock with, with flocks with sheep, what's going to happen? They're going to spread all over. If you don't have a control and control them in one corner and open one direction for them to go and lead them, if you are too busy doing everything and shining down your cars, <laughs> then... The flock's going to be gone. When you look, they're out of control and you can't even get them back together. There's going to be disunity. There's going to be trouble in the church. It's fear biting because there's no meat. People are hungry. And if people are hungry for the word of God, that's when the master craft stepped in. You know the scripture that talks about the sower who sow and some fell on stony grounds this is like that parable there. Because you see, during the time of the storm, the brokenness, that's when the master killer comes in, the devil. And he comes in and starts to sow deceit against the brethren and send people against each other. I'm telling you, he's going to start to sow. And what is going to happen then if the sheep scatter? I'm telling you, the world's not joking around. The fallen angels is a sign already to catch all those who are not on serious grounds, who are falling from the churches with new doctrine, new things. This goes to evil talk about evil the home. If you have the shepherd in the home, who is involved in witchcraft, and you have 10 children, what do you think is going to happen? I'm going to read it again. It says, And they were scattered because there is no shepherd, and they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. Disunity. And when there's disunity, the enemy moves in and separates people and then conquers them. It's the same way the wolves done it. If the sheep break up and one is over here, the, the wolves circle that one and take it down. I'm telling you, it's the same strategy. Because you see, we are able to, to visualize the sheep. So God is talking to us in a spiritual sense and says, visualize the shepherd with the sheep then. Since you can't get the spiritual application, visit, visualize the physical and see how the shepherd is moving and some distraction or he's not paying attention and everybody just scatter. And then the wolves move in. What about the people who are practicing witchcraft and they're wondering why their children is not doing well? Because the wolves are moving in. What about the people who are addicted to gambling and they're wandering? What about the people who are addicted to pornography and they're wandering? You know that pornography is really serious. Because you see, pornography, if you watch pornography, demon is going to enter you. 
Because that's a doorway for, for sexual demon to enter you. And then you have no more control over yourself. It's the same thing. If you have an addiction to gamble, and you open the door of gambling, as soon as you get some cash, you will be just going like this. A voice saying to you, go back now and you can win everything. I'm telling you. <laughs> and when you go there, do, as when you go there and you set $100, he may just give you back 500 out of what they have for you already. You know, so you feel good and you will go back again. And then he take 2,000 from you and then you come back, he give you like 500 again, encouraging you to spend some more. Come on. God's people need to wake up. That's how the addiction is. I'm telling you, there's demons in those computers at the racetrack and, and all this woodbine. When you go there, there's a spirit telling you. And as soon as you get the money, you're going there. You can't even stop it. The sheep are, sheep are not being fed, the flocks. That's what the Lord is saying tonight. He's calling for high people, for powerful people who are ready to spread the gospel, who are ready to deliver the word. What a God we serve. What a God we save. I want you to underline that verse. Don't go away before you underline that verse. Verse 5. Because when there's brokenness in your family, it's because there's no shepherd. A lot of men are not in the home. I did that sermon, We Are the Men. You remember that sermon? That's very powerful. You can go online and look at it. Because the men are not in the home who's supposed to be the leaders. So what? The homes are being destroyed and falling apart. Because you see, the wolves are moving in. The sheep are scattered. Look at verse, verse 6. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and up on every high hill. Yea, my flocks were scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search and seek after them. God is talking about the blind leaders. There's a lot of blind leaders in the church that is all about themselves. People are gone from the church. There's so many people, so many people in the church that got pregnant, young people. They never return to the church. And nobody go after them like they really want to save them. Nobody in the board meeting commission. Instead, they will say, well, she shouldn't get any posts again. It's all about postman and position. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's what the Lord is saying. They've gone up to the hill. They've gone far away, need to be delivered, and nobody's going after them. We need some sheep to start to work. No, serious. The, the, the shepherd is not working in the church. Jeez. We need the sheep them to start to go and start to gather some of your, your brothers and sisters. I'm telling you, serious. We need to push a little further because the churches are sleeping. We're not having powerful leaders. Where the message is coming, where the church is shaking with the gospel message. Everything is too polished down. Everything is too well prepared. It's so well prepared till you can't miss a word. No. God is looking for shepherds. Simple. Just have a rod. Rod of God. Just listen for the Lord to say the word to feed the sheep. That's the power. We don't have to go in our studies for five hours to prepare a message. No. All the Lord requires is you coming out with a rod. Rod of God. As the shepherd. As the shepherd who takes his order from the master shepherd, which is Christ Jesus. That's what he wants us to do. To come forth. Pray, brethren, for the leaders that God will wake them up to start to preach the gospel message with fire, with urgency, that we are five minutes to midnight and Christ is about to come and a lot of people going to Christless grave because they haven't been taught. 
They haven't been fed. They are hungry. They are dying of hunger, starving. Mercy. Okay, we, we're wrapping up. I'm at verse what? Seven. I'm going to read a little faster now. And it says, Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. It's a warning. You haven't been doing your job. And the Lord is warning now because the time is coming. The Lord is saying, I'm tired of the leaders who are not doing their job. He's saying there's desolation. There's darkness upon the world. The word of God needs to come forth. And he says in verse 8, As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, my flock became meat to every beast of the field. Because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherd search for my flock, but the shepherd fed themselves and fed not my flock. Lord have mercy. This word is powerful. It's powerful. It's saying it. Verse 9 says, Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. It's a warning to all the preachers, people who are playing on the pulpit of God, playing church, just preaching pretty sermon, don't know God. God is saying, listen, there's a time coming when I'm going to move the shepherds. There's a time coming. Judgment starts at the house of the Lord. There's a time coming when he's going to wake up people and move them, root them up. As Isaiah says, Jeremiah, root them up and throw them out. That's what is going to happen. That day of the Lord is coming because some people are so covered up and pampered that they think they can't move. You think I'm the shepherd, I can't be moved. I have to pray and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Don't let me fall, Jesus. I don't know about you. I don't know about you. And the next verse, we are at verse what, 10? And it says, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds. Underline it. You can put priests, you can put pastors, you can put elders, whatever. You can put prophets, anyone who thinks you're a leader. And it says, And I will require my flock at their hand and cause them to cease from feeding the flocks. Oh, come on, come on. God is going to move people from the church who's plain Christian, who's only collecting money and flying private jets. Uh, you know, God's people need the word. The days are numbered. But people are just looking for money, money, money. But the Lord is saying, man, Mercy. And it says, it says, continuing verse 10, it says, Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves anymore. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I have to underline this. You know, whatever they were feeding themselves with, I know it's pride and everything, but everything is going to be cut off in the name of Jesus Christ. All the money and the pride you have is going to be cut off. Because you think that you are higher than God. And that's what is happening. A lot of preachers think they have everything made. And I'm in charge. Some people think they own the church. You can't even do program in some of the church. Some of the shepherds think they're high and mighty and lifted up. Yes. And nothing can happen under my church, my roof. God is going to root them out in Jesus' name. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. God is not joking. And here it is now. It says, and their mouth that they may not be meat for them. No food. They're going to be starved from the word of God. All the evil is going to turn around on them. And it says, for thus saith the Lord God, behold, I even I will both search my sheep and seek them out. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that when... The earthly shepherd who he have called to feed the sheep 
fail. Praise God the Lord loves us so much that he will step in and he will let you know that he loves you and he's going to deliver you. He's going to lift you high. He said, I will do it personally. That's how he loves you tonight. That's how he cares about you, that he will come personally to you and says, I love you. I will supply your needs. They are not doing it in the church. There's a day coming. I'm going to move them, and I'm going to empower my people. I'm going to feed my sheep. I'm going to lay hands and bring healing to many people in God's church. There's going to be a revival more than ever heard before. That day is coming, the powerful day of the Lord when you will hold your hands and people will be healed. It's going to be more powerful than the day of Pentecost. That day is coming, the Lord have to intervene with all the foolishness that is going on. God have to intervene. The church is sleeping. They are in deep sleep. Verse 12 says, As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep, that are scattered and will deliver them out of the places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. Lord have mercy. The Lord is saying, even though you are in sin and you are lost, when he comes to search for us, he's going to come in the day where he can't miss us. His light is going to just lit everything up because God is the light. When he comes to find us, he will find his sheep. Is the Lord looking for you tonight? Does he want to save you tonight from everything you're going through? Are you willing for the Lord to search you out and to find you? I'm going to read. I'm down to the almost the last. And it says in verse 13. Is it 13? Yes. And it says, yeah, 13. And it says, and I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and I will bring them to their own land, mercy, and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. Have you ever heard about Beulah land? I wish Sister Melanie was here to sing, Oh, Beulah Land. It's so powerful. God is going to take us to that place. You see, he's pointing us to the, to the, 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 the kingdom when he comes. That's why he's feeding us. The ultimate goal is to go home with him. And it says in verse 14, I will feed them in the good pasture. Praise the Lord. And up on the high mountain of Israel shall there be Foul be, there shall they lie in a good fall, and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. That's spiritual remuse. That's high-level spiritual thing the Lord is talking about. It says in verse 15, I will feed my flock, and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord. Mercy. When you lie down, when you have peace, when there's comfort, you don't have to do anything. You are in a pasture where there's grass and all different things, and you are relaxing. You are lying down because the Lord is with you. There is peace. That's where the Lord wants to take us to, to that peace. And it says in verse 16, I will seek that which was lost and bring them again, that which was driven away, and I will bind up that which was broken and will strengthen that which was, was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment, mercy. The end is coming. And it says in verse 17, the last verse I will read, it says, And as for you, O my flock, thus saith the Lord God, 
Behold, I judge between cattle and cattle, between the rams and the goat. Mercy, I've got to stop there. This is too powerful. This should have a part two. This is too powerful. Are you a ram or a goat? Who are you? I'm telling you, it's a serious thing. The Lord is saying, listen, the judgment hour is already planned. Everything is already sealed. But praise the Lord, he said, he's going to be our shepherd. He's really going to come and supply our needs. The church is not fulfilling the need. The leaders of the church is not fulfilling the need. God is appealing to all the sheep, to his flocks. Study the word. Stay in the word and I will feed you. And I will bring you to that land where there's going to be milk and honey. I will bring you to that land where you can lie down and be peaceful. There's going to be no more tears, no more war, no more depression, no more anger, no more sadness. There's coming a day when he said, I will wipe away every tears from your eyes. Do you have tears in your eyes tonight? Do you want the Lord to wipe away your tears? Do you want the Lord to wipe away your tears? Mm -hmm. God is so powerful. What a God we serve. What a mighty rock. Amen. He's able. The God we serve, he's able. Tonight, as I close tonight, I'm going to pray. If you purpose in your heart tonight that you want the Lord to do something powerfully, you want him to reconsecrate. You want to come as the sheep, as the flock comes to the shepherd. You see, the flock knows their master. Tonight, the Lord is saying the earthly master is not doing their job. It's time when he said, I'm going to have to step in. I'm going to have to stop what is going on. I'm going to have to move some of the worldly people from the church. The Lord is saying tonight, if you want to be transformed, if you want to be moved by the power of God, if you want God to do something tonight, I'm going to ask you in this sanctuary to stand with me. I'm not asking everybody to stand. If you really believe that you want to give your heart to the Lord tonight, you want the Lord to move mightily on your heart, tonight, you want to surrender. If that's what you want God to do, you want to say, Lord, take my heart tonight. I want to do the right thing. I want to go with you when you come. If that's your decision, the Lord is prompting you. He's speaking to you. Do you want to give your life to the Lord tonight? Tonight as you make the decision, if you want God to transform you, you're standing in this sanctuary. On the prayer line, you can stand up. If you're not able to, God knows. He wants to do something. We're tired of playing church, you see. God wants to step in. I went to the hospital and see people hurting, seeing young people in the hospital that needs to be delivered. And Christian people are so weak. We're not trusting in our God. Tonight, I'm going to ask the Lord to touch down in this place. Tonight, I'm going to ask the Lord for favor because he's the true shepherd and he's able through the blood of Jesus Christ. Let us pray tonight, right now. Father in heaven, great God whom we serve, the mighty rock, the rose of Sharon, the great Redeemer, Jesus Christ, whom we love. We come to you, Jesus. Nothing in our hands we bring, but simply, O oh God, to the cross we're clinging. We see in the urgency, Jesus, for you to come. But Lord, we are weary. We are broken. We are tired. But praise your name for the hope that you are the true shepherd. 
As we look to you tonight, as your people on the prayer line look to you tonight, Jesus, as your people in the sanctuary of God look to you tonight, I pray to the divine power, the divine providence, that you will move with might. You will shake and you will bind up the shepherd of the earth, bind up Satan and his agent from your people. May you bring deliverance, O oh God, to whoever watching, to whoever is listening. Let this be a mighty revival. Let there be restoration. Let there be confession. Let there be sorrow. Let there be a turning from sin because we love you, Jesus. I pray, O oh God in heaven, that your Holy Spirit, O oh God, will move with power to your congregation. Move on the prayer line, oh God. Restore your people one more time. Oh God, restore your people. Please, oh God, hear us tonight. Hear us, oh God. The battle is yours. Fight for us, Jesus. Fight for us. We thank you now, oh God, as we surrender everything to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we thank you, praise you, exalt you, in Jesus Christ's name. Praise God. May the good Lord be with you and strengthen you, in Jesus' name.